It's my um, very great pleasure to welcome everybody here tonight for the very first of our G Research lecture series. It's, thank you especially to all of those who have joined us from outside of London tonight and made the trip here, especially for this lecture. The, I want to say a very special thank you to our guest, the first speaker in our lecture series, who's traveled all the way here from Texas to be with us, Scott, ladies and gentlemen, Scott Aronson. So tonight's lecture is the first of what will be a series of lectures. We will be holding them biannually and inviting some of the world's leading scientists, thinkers, to talk to us all, G Research employees, friends in academia, some of our partners that we've worked with for years, and other invited guests here this evening, to talk to us about the fields in which they are the recognized world leaders. The, so it's an absolute pleasure to provide this platform and we're very grateful for all of you being here with us to share it. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Christoph, who's played a big part in making this lecture series happen. He's been involved in every step of the way and I would like to invite him up here to introduce our speaker tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Christoph. Oh yeah, thank you very much. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I just wanted to um, point out our fantastic uh, new uh, scheme for asking questions for the Q&A session afterwards. So Scott um, is going to talk for about an hour, and afterwards we have, we're going to have about 15 minutes of uh, questions and answers. So if you have a question, if you, there's something you've always wondered about in the field of quantum computing or complexity th uh, theory in general, tonight is your chance to ask it. Um, normally, kind of the old school way of doing this would be just to raise your hand and ask a question. But in this day and age, there's an app for this. And uh, you've, um, you've all got these sheets of paper and kind of in front of you or behind you or under you. Um, if you look at the bottom in, in blue, there is a URL. Um, if you go to that URL um, on your mobile phone, then you will be uh, able to ask a question. And uh, uh, by the way, while you do that, put your phones to silent. And um, we have a little bureau of censorship up front here uh, where we're kind of picking the, the best questions, um, whatever that may mean, and uh, those will then be asked uh, at the end of the talk. So um, now for tonight's speaker, and I think that is going to be a real treat because um, Scott Aronson is uh, really one of, one of the world's experts on quantum computing and complexity theory, and he's also kind of very well known in the field as being one of the best and mo most entertaining speakers, so I'm uh, really looking forward to it. Um, Scott is currently the uh, David J. Bruton Centennial uh, Professor of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin, at which is a post he's uh, held only for a few months. Before that, um, he's had a really rather illustrious academic career, having done his PhD at Berkeley, um, postdocs at the Institute of, of Advanced Studies in Princeton and at the University of Waterloo, and then uh, he was a faculty um, member at MIT for a number of years. Um, he has collected a large number of prizes. Uh, it's kind of um, not enough, uh, uh, we don't have enough time here to go through them all, but just to mention a few, he's a, a recipient of the uh, 2012 Alan T. Waterman Award of the United National um, Science Foundation in the United States. He received a Presidential Early Career Award for uh, Scientists and Engineers in 2010 and a Sloan Research Fellowship in 2009. And really, I, I could go on, um, but then the evening would be over. So, um, so um, in addition to, uh, to just uh, his, his uh, illustrious research career, he's also written a book. The, the book is called Quantum Computing Since Democritus, which uh, may sound unusual. Um, but it's, uh, what's even more unusual is uh, the, uh, the rave reviews that, uh, that it received. Um, and I'm just going to quote the first line of uh, one of the re reviews here. And uh, it says, I laughed, I cried, I fell off my chair. And that was just reading the chapter on computational complexity. <laughs> so in addition to all of that, he, he's uh, got the official position of zookeeper at the uh, 
Complexity Zoo, which is an interesting wiki style um, uh, website. Uh, so if you ever wondered uh, how sort of P and P space and NP and so on uh, all relate to each other, that's the pl uh, place to go. And of course, he's known for having one of the um, best blogs in the field, um, if not the only blog in some sense, um, uh, called Stetl uh, Optimized. Um, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Um, which really is sort of the, the go-to destination if you're interested in, um, uh, in the kind of latest developments in, in these fields. I was first uh, um, you know, kind of pointed towards this blog by, by our head of risk, who just kept sending me sort of links, kind of, Christoph, you gotta check out this, Christoph, have a look at that. Um, so he seems to have been such a frequent visitor, um, which I think says two things. Um, first of all, um, the blog is slightly addictive, and second of all, um, the risk is probably under control, which is a good thing. Um, yeah, and if that wasn't enough, he also seems to kind of lately uh, consult the Obama administration on uh, what qu quantum computing is all about. Um, my, my own personal theory is just that uh, probably um, Barack Obama got a bit jealous when he heard Justin Trudeau kind of, uh, riff on about quantum computing um, uh, the other week and now wants to make amends. Um, but he seems to be in good hands. So uh, with, um, without further ado, uh, I just wanted to thank Scott um, that he could make time in his uh, really quite busy schedule to be here with us tonight. And um, he solved the traveling salesman problem um, and uh, managed to stop over here on, on his way from, from um, Texas uh, towards uh, kind of southern Europe and further on. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for being here tonight, Scott, and uh, we're very much uh, looking forward to your talk on quantum computing and the limits of the efficiently computable. All right. Uh, can you hear okay? All right, well, uh, thank you so much, Christoph, for the overly kind introduction that I'll uh, never uh, live up to. Uh, th uh, thank you to everyone at G Research for inviting me here. Uh, it's uh, always great to, uh, to, to uh, have a chance to visit London. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, especially as, uh, as my country uh, implodes. Uh, so, um, um, uh, I, I, I'm very sorry to hear that I, I may have been costing uh, G Research some, you know, productivity, you know, you know, or or uh, or, or may have, uh, you know, caused some some important risks to be overlooked. I'll, uh, um, uh, if it if it if it if it if it's any consolation, you know, the uh, blogging also uh, 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 cuts into my research pretty seriously. So uh, uh, so okay so so. Um, um, when I did a Google image search for quantum computer, this is one of the first things that came up. Uh, I don't think that that's what they look like, uh, but uh, one thing that will become apparent in this talk is that I'm really a theorist. I'm not an engineer. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the engineers will you know, barely even let me into the lab. I'll probably just break something. Uh, but uh, my, my starting point actually has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It's uh, just to um, step back and ask, what are the fundamental limits of technology? And, uh, you know, there are certain technologies that, you know, would be really, really great and that, you know, a lot of us have wanted since we were kids, and yet they never seem to show up. Uh, so the first of these is a warp drive. You know, uh, you know, we've been waiting for it. Where is it? Uh, secondly, uh, the perpetual motion machine. So, you know, the, uh, the, the real solution to the world's energy problems. And uh, the third is what I'll call the Uber computer. Okay, and this is a machine that, well, it doesn't necessarily tell you the meaning of life or anything like that, but, you know, it immediately answers any well-posed mathematical question that you put to it. So here we see the computer being asked uh, about Goldbach's conjecture, which says every even number four or greater is the sum of two primes, and it just says true. Next question. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, I think that, you know, some people have the idea that this is what computers already are, but, uh, you know, I probably don't have to tell you that, uh, you know, even with uh, uh, our, our most powerful computing resources today, you know, we face limitations. There are certain things that we can do and other things that we don't even try to do because we know that uh, with the best algorithms today, you know, or sometimes even with the best algorithms that could exist, uh, it would take longer than the age of the universe. Okay, so um, so now uh, I want to uh, uh, you know make the point 
that, uh, uh, you know, in the first two cases, uh, we actually know a great deal from physics about why these machines uh, don't seem to exist. Okay, it's not an issue that just, you know, uh, not enough money has been spent or the engineers weren't smart enough or, or something like that. Uh, uh, but, it, you know, it goes uh, uh, back to, to, to very basic facts about physics. Uh, in the case of warp drive, you could say uh, the issue is special relativity, or in other words, the causal structure of space-time, which says that if you can send a signal faster than the speed of light, then in someone's frame of reference, you're sending that signal backwards in time. Uh, which then means you have to worry about what happens if you go back in time and you kill your grandfather and therefore you're not born, but then therefore you are born and so forth. You know, no one wants to deal with that, okay? So, um, you know, except for us, we can write papers about it, okay? But, uh, 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 you know, then uh, uh, with the perpetual motion machine, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, the second law of thermodynamics that uh, rules it out. Okay, but what about the third case? Uh, you know, are there fundamental principles of physics that explain why we can't have uber computers, or, or maybe we can have them after all? Okay, which is what are the fundamental limits on computation that are imposed by physics? So that's sort of where 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 I start, and then that sort of you know uh, will will sort of force us to study quantum computation, like it or not. Okay, but um, uh, let me just first just just briefly uh, uh, plunge you into the world where I, you know, spend a lot of my time. Uh, so uh, as, as Christoph mentioned, if you, you know, want to see like 500 of these classes, you can go to my complexity zoo, which I, uh, uh, I, I no longer really update, but uh, it's, um, you know, the, in, in uh, uh, theoretical computer science, uh, a lot of what we do is just try to understand how different computational problems relate to each other. And uh, to do that, we sort of organize them into classes. And, uh, you, know, we, you know, the physicists have much cooler names for things. You know, they call things, you know, uh, uh, you know quarks and black holes. You know, we're stuck with non-deterministic polynomial time and uh, things like that. Okay, but it's, uh, you know, uh, work with me here, okay, because these are really, you know, pretty basic. These are like the, you know, the periodic table of the elements or something. Okay, so at the bottom, you know, we have P, which is uh, the class of all the problems, technically decision problems, the, for which there is an algorithm running on a you know, an ordinary computer, like the one in your pocket, uh, that uh, uses a number of steps that grows like, you know, the size of the input instance raised to some fixed power. Okay, that we call polynomial time. And that's just sort of our rough and ready criterion for uh, an efficient algorithm, one that takes a reasonable amount of time, okay? So an example of a problem in P would be, you know, I give you a map and I ask you whether every city is reachable from every other one, uh, you know, following bus routes or something, okay? Uh, that one, you know, you know, just uh, uh, in introductory algorithms courses, you know, undergraduates learn how to solve that, okay? Uh, another example would be I give you a number written in binary and you have to tell whether it's prime or composite. Okay, that's a much less obvious example. In fact, it was only proven to be in this class P in 2002, okay? Uh, although uh, for decades before that, we had known of probabilistic algorithms that uh, uh, can uh, uh, tell whether a number is prime or composite, and those, were, those algorithms were very important for cryptography. Okay, uh, so P, I would say, encompasses actually most of what we actually do in practice with our computers. You know, most of what your, your web browser is doing, your word processor is doing, and so forth. And by the way, you know, notice that when I say a problem, I really mean an infinite collection of questions, right? Like, uh, you know, any particular uh, 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 map, I won't even dignify by calling a problem, okay? It's just an instance. Okay, the set of all maps, now that's a problem. So now NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time, and that's basically just the class of all the problems where if, the if there is a solution, then the it can be proven to you, okay, and, uh, you know, using a short proof that you can pretty quickly check, okay, a che you know, there's a polynomial time checking algorithm. 
Okay, so uh, a great example of a problem in NP is factoring a number into primes. Okay, uh, or like I could ask some question like, uh, does this number have at least three prime factors? Okay, now, it, you know, that, that for all we know is a very, very hard problem to solve at least with a classical computer, you know. Well, uh, but, uh, but if uh, uh, the answer is yes, then it's very easy to prove it to someone. How do you prove it? Well, you just show them the factors, you know, and they can check for themselves that they're prime and that they, you know, that they do indeed divide the number. Okay, so, uh, so, so it has this nice checkability to it. Um, and in fact, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the hard problems that we try to solve with our, uh, uh, Computers actually uh, are, 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 are like that. Okay, uh, optimization problems also they can be phrased in a way where they're in NP, right? Like uh, you know, uh, Christoph, you know, mentioned the traveling salesman, right? You know that uh, 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 you know, like like if, if you just uh, uh, want to know, like, is there a route that visits each of these cities? You know, with uh, you know, covering at most five thousand kilometers in total. Uh, um, you know, if there is a route, then that's pretty easy to prove to someone. You just show them the route, okay? Even though finding it might require examining an astronomical number of possibilities. Okay, so now, uh, uh, you know, now we call a problem NP hard if it has the prob property that if I gave you a magic box for that problem, then you could use it to solve all of the NP problems in polynomial time. Okay, uh, following Alan Turing, we call that magic box an oracle. Okay, so, uh, um, so, so uh, uh, you know, and then an NP-complete problem is just a problem that is both NP-hard and itself in NP. So these are like the maximally hard problems in the class NP. They're uh, the prob NP problems that capture the difficulty, each one of them, of every NP problem. Okay, and uh, uh, so the great discovery that really started theoretical computer science in the early 70s is that not just one or two, but thousands of the problems that people uh, want to solve in practice, including traveling salesmen, including uh, protein folding, uh, airline scheduling, all kinds of industrial optimization problems, uh, you know, problems uh, in, in finance, uh, you know, portfolio optimization, th th things of that kind. Uh, 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 playing Super Mario Brothers, uh, playing uh, Minesweeper, okay, if anyone remembers that, okay, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, you give, you know, just about any problem that involves satisfying a huge number of constraints, you know, uh, uh, fitting a bunch of s uh, suitcases into the trunk of your car, okay, uh, you know, and uh, chances are such a problem will be NP complete, typically, you know, unless it has a very good reason not to be. Okay, now, there are a few very special problems. So factoring, we don't think is NP-complete. You know, it has a lot of special structure that seems to prevent it from being NP-complete. As an example, you know, the traveling salesman problem, right, there might, you know, if I give you a map, there might be uh, one tour that visits each city uh, with less than 5,000 kilometers, or, or there might be a million tours, or there might be none. You don't really know, but if I give you a number, Right, you know in advance how many prime factorizations it has. You know, it has exactly one up to the ordering of the factors because you could prove that 2,300 years ago. Okay, so factoring is, re the point is factoring may be hard uh, for all we know. It may be not in P, but it doesn't seem to be NP hard. Okay, so, so there's something special about it. And in fact, the special properties of factoring are, are, are what make it so useful for cryptography. And they're why, for, for better or worse, we sort of base the security of almost all of our electronic commerce on the belief that factoring and a few related problems really are hard. Okay, we'll see that quantum computers, uh, uh, you know, uh, severely call that belief into question. Okay, so now, you know, the uh, famous question that you may have heard uh, is, uh, you know, whether uh, P equals NP, okay? So no one can actually, has actually proven that this picture, you know, doesn't just all come crashing down with every NP complete problem and everything in NP actually in P. Okay, so I call this a literally million dollar question. You know, if you solve it, you get a million dollars from this uh, 
Clay Math Foundation. Uh, you know, it's one of seven problems that carries that reward, including uh, the Riemann hypothesis, uh, the Poincaré conjecture, which was solved in 2002 by Perelman, although he turned down the prize, okay, and, uh, and four other problems. Okay, now my opinion is that P versus NP is actually manifestly the most important of all these problems. Okay, and I'll give you an argument for that. And the argument is, well, suppose that P were equal to NP. Okay, and suppose, for, you know, if, if the algorithm took, you know, N to the 10,000 time or something, you know, that would be formally polynomial, but that would be pretty useless in practice. Okay, but, but grant me the further assumption that the algorithm actually ran efficiently in practice, so it was a reasonable polynomial. Okay, in that case, uh, you know, you would certainly solve this question, but, uh, but actually, you could solve you know, the other six of the questions as well, because you would simply program your computer to find these uh, solutions for you. Okay? You would ask your computer, for example, is there a proof of the Riemann hypothesis in some formal language, you know, like you know, Zermelo-Frankel set theory or something, uh, with, with at most a billion symbols? Okay? And if such a proof existed, then you, know, you could find it, in, in not all that much more time than it would take to write the proof down at all. Okay, this is what it would mean if P equaled NP. You know, it would be an almost a metaphysical enormity. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's not surprising that most of us in this field uh, expect that P is not equal to NP. In fact, I like to say that if we were physicists, we would have just declared that a law of nature and been done with it. Okay, and you know, we would have we would have given ourselves Nobel prizes for the discovery of that law, and uh, you know, and then if, if later it turned out that actually P equaled NP, we would just give ourselves more Nobel prizes for the for the refutation of the law. Okay, but because we're sort of you know mathematicians or cousins of mathematicians, we have to call it a conjecture. That's the term that we use. Okay. Um, but uh, um, okay, you know, and, and I've sh you know, so this uh, uh, you know question uh, has even made it into pop culture. It's been on The Simpsons, on Futurama, on various TV shows and movies that are not as good. So I won't go into them. But uh, uh, you know, it's um, yeah. So so you know, one could you know, I could give a whole talk just about you know this question, and you know, one well, one could spend a whole lifetime studying it. But for me, where things really get interesting is when one asks. You know, is that is P versus NP? You know, really, you know, the question to be asking, right? Or does you know who is to say that you know this class P that that encompasses what you can do with a in polynomial time with a Turing machine? You know, with this model of computation that Alan Turing laid down in the 1930s and that's been with us, you know, for the last 80 years. But you know, who is to say that that ex that 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 this you know, mathematical model really exhausts all the computations that the physical universe lets us do. Okay, so the central uh, belief, sort of connecting the, um, the, the, you know, the, the mathematical definitions, you know, that I talked about to the physical world is something called the Church-Turing thesis. Okay, and so the, the original Church-Turing thesis well, the, you know, the version of it that I like is, is a version that, you know, that actually just sticks its neck out and makes a falsifiable claim about, you know, physical reality, okay? And it says that everything that is, um, um, com you know, you know uh, 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 that is buildable in the physical world actually can be simulated to arbitrary accuracy uh, by a Turing machine, or at the very worst, by a Turing machine uh, with a random number generator. Okay. Uh, now, the the you know, and there's something that we call the extended Church-Turing thesis that sticks its neck out further and says that that actually uh, any physical system that you can build can be simulated using a deterministic or pro or at any rate a probabilistic Turing machine, uh, and with at most a polynomial overhead in time and memory. Okay. So the physical world can not only be simulated by a Turing machine, it can be efficiently simulated. Okay, and you know, I think when I was a, a, a teenager, right, like this, you know, just like came to me, you know, as a, as a revelation, this thesis, and, and like in retrospect, like it was just obvious, how could it be otherwise? The world is a giant video game. 
you know, and we just, you know, you know, we're, we're too big and clumsy to see the pixels. But, you know, if we were, you know, at a small enough scale, we would, ju you know, we would see that, you know, just like, uh, uh, you know, Mario just ultimately reduces to these lines of code, you know, so, do, so, do, so does the physical universe. And all the stuff that physicists, you know, go on and on about, the, you know, the electroweak, you know, symmetry breaking and all, you know, it's all just encoding details. Okay, so, uh, you know, that's sort of the enormity of what this extended church touring thesis says. And, yet, you know, it sort of stood for, for decades, I think. Uh, but, you know, it behooves us to ask, you know, how sure are we of that thesis? You know, what would a serious challenge to it even look like? Okay, so even before uh, we, we come to quantum computing, people had called this uh, extended church touring thesis into question. So I want to give you, you know, a few examples of, uh, of, of what, what could be true about the world that would make this thesis false. Okay, so here's my first example. Uh, so uh, there's a, a very fun uh, experiment, you know, uh, s I think s since the 1960s or so, where you take two glass plates, okay, and you put pegs between them in whatever pattern you like, and then you dip the resulting contraption into a tub of soapy water, and then you take it out. Okay, and uh, you know what, what will happen is that some bubbles, uh, some soap bubbles will, will form, some soap films uh, uh, in between the pegs. And you know, being soap films, they like to relax into their lowest energy state. Okay, and uh, typically that means they like to uh, form the, the smallest total length of bubble uh, connecting all the pegs together, where you know, different uh, 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 bubble films could meet at uh, an intermediate point like that. Okay, so you can try it at home. You can, you can see that this is typically what happens. Okay, but now the, the puzzle is that finding the minimum total length of line segments that connect a collection of uh, points in the Euclidean plane is a famous NP-complete problem, okay, or NP-hard problem. It's called the minimum Steiner tree problem, okay? Uh, and yet, you know, uh, uh, I was just telling you that, that uh, it seems like nature solves it instantaneously, okay? So, so we're faced with a puzzle, which is, you know, is a tub of soapy water doing what our fastest supercomputers cannot, okay? Uh, and um, there was a discussion about this on the internet, you know, maybe, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, 13 or 14 years ago, and, uh, you know, some people made what I thought was the, the right analysis of the situation, which is that, well, it's true that systems in nature like to relax to their lowest energy states, but they don't always succeed. For example, if we consider it a rock and some crevice on a mountainside, well, it could reach a state of lower potential energy by rolling up first and then rolling down. But it's rarely observed to do that, right? So, uh, you know, systems could get stuck in local optima, or what we call metastable states, okay? And so why shouldn't we expect that the same is true here? And, you know, uh, so, so if, for example, you know, you created a, uh, a, a, a configuration of pegs where in order to find the minimum Steiner tree, you know, nature would have to uh, break some, you know, some... Uh, uh, 2,000 bit, you know, RSA key or something, right? Then it's probably not going to do it, right? Okay, so then, but then other people were, you know, argued with that. You know, someone said, well, this is just the academic computer science party line. You know, you all repeat this. I bet not one of you has tried the experiment. You have no idea what you're talking about. So, you know, as I said, I'm a theorist. This led to the one foray into experimental physics in my, in my life, I guess, where I, uh, uh, you know, so I'm wearing gloves because I, you can actually cut your hands on soapy glass, it turns out. I should have used plexiglass, okay? But uh, it's a very cool experiment, uh, you know, with f five or six pegs. Typically, you do find the minimum Steiner tree. You know, then you start adding more, let's say seven pegs, eight pegs, and then uh, not only do you not always find it, but sometimes you get sort of an intermediate cycle of, uh, of bubble, which, you know, so it's not even a tree, which then proves that it can't be optimal. Okay, so, you know, I didn't try every possible brand of soap, 
But, uh, you know, I think there's some circumstantial evidence that nature is not solving NP-complete problems by magic. Great, now this may sound silly, and yet, you know, every year or so, you'll see in the popular press another article about, you know, someone solving NP-complete problems by some approach that amounts to the same thing as this. Okay, or people will say, well, what about protein folding? You know, uh, you, know you can formalize uh, uh, folding a protein in such a way that that, too, is an NP-hard problem. And yet every cell in your body does it every second. So does that mean that biology has the ability to just surpass the extended church Turing thesis. Okay, well, in that case, I think, you know, for one thing, there's been a lot of selection pressure uh, on proteins for them to uh, fold in predictable ways. You know, if you had a protein, you know, an amino acid chain, where in order for it to fold into its lowest energy state, nature had to find a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, that would just be a bad protein. It would probably be selected against by evolution. Okay, and yet even despite that, you know, proteins do misfold sometimes. So prions, which are the agent of mad cow disease, seem to be an example of that. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, but now, you know, let's move on. So the, uh, you know, we all talk so much about quantum computers, but what about the other great theory of 20th century physics? So how about a relativity computer? Okay, so the idea here is uh, incredibly simple. It's that you start your computer uh, working on some really hard problem, maybe an NP-complete one, and then you leave your computer on Earth. Now, you board a spaceship, which accelerates to a relativistic speed, then it decelerates and it returns to Earth. Okay, now, of course, in Earth's frame of reference, you know, billions of years have, have uh, elapsed, you know, a civilization is long extinct. Actually, you know, it may have gone extinct just in, you know, 2018 or something, but, you know, but at any rate, it's, it's, it's gone extinct by then, okay? And, you know, all your friends are long dead, uh, you know, but, uh, but if you can dig your computer out of the rubble and somehow it was still running, you can find the answer to your computational problem. Okay, so to me, this raises an obvious question, which is why doesn't anyone try this? Okay, uh, I mean, if you're worried about your friends, you could just take them with you on the spaceship, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, it, it, the question is, you know, is there anything in the, in the known laws of physics that actually rules this out? Okay, and, and I think that actually the very interesting answer in this case is yes. And, uh, and the, the problem has to do with the amount of energy that it would take to accelerate to that close to relativistic speed. So um, if you wanted to get an exponential computational speed up, then you can calculate that uh, your spaceship would have to accelerate to exponentially close to the speed of light, like, you know, C minus 1 over 2 to the n or something. Okay, and uh, to do that uh, requires an exponential amount of energy, which means that you know you're escaping one exponential only to uh, land, uh, you know, in the jaws of another. Right? How long will it now take you to fuel up your spaceship before before launch? You know, where are you going to get an exponential amount of rocket fuel? Okay, and 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 so forth. We face questions like that. So, you know, there's a very, very general lesson in case after case, when you look at just one or two of the laws of physics and ignore the others, it can look like you have the ability to uh, solve NP-complete problems instantly, or for that matter, the ability to send signals faster than light or, or other things like that. But you really have to look at all the laws together. Okay, uh, another uh, a similar case uh, concerns what I'll call the Zeno computer. Okay, and this is simply a computer that does the first step of its operation in one second, the next step in half a second, the next step in a quarter second, the next step in an eighth second, and so on, so that after two seconds, it's done infinitely many steps. Okay, again, this raises the question, why doesn't anyone try it? Okay, well, in fact, you know, people do try something that's not uh, 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 unrelated to this, which is that they try to overclock their microprocessor you know, run it faster than its recommended speed, right? But now some of you may know the danger in doing that. The danger is that if you run your microprocessor too much faster than it's supposed to be run, it will overheat and it will melt, okay? I mean, this is why computers have fans, 
you know, and uh, it's why, you know, for, uh, for some time, su you know, some supercomputers were actually cooled with liquid nitrogen or uh, liquid helium so that they could safely be run faster. Um, now, again, you know, it's interesting to ask, what are the fundamental limits here? Uh, so um, what uh, turns out is that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, as you wanted to run your computer faster and faster, you would need more and more refrigeration. You'd have to get it closer and closer to absolute zero. Okay, and then if you're running it fast enough, then you might as well just stop talking about refrigeration, and you might as well just talk about, you know, the, the energy contained in the computation itself. And, 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 and where does that stop? Well, suppose that you ran your computer so fast that it was doing 10 to the 43 operations per second. That is one operation per Planck time. Okay, and the simplest such computer would be, let's say, a photon that just bounces between two mirrors to, you know, tick off uh, uh, time steps, uh, uh, let's say, you know, um, that are 10 to the minus 33 centimeters apart. So, you know, once every, every Planck time, just bounces back and forth. Okay, but now what you can calculate is that such a computer would have so much energy confined to so small of a volume that it would exceed its Schwarzschild radius. Okay, now that's just a fancy way of saying that your computer will collapse to a black hole. Okay, which, you know, I've always loved as sort of nature's way of telling you not to try something. Okay, so, um, okay, okay, but now what about quantum computing? Uh, you knew it was coming. Uh, these are some happy uh, spin one-half particles, okay? Uh, uh, I, think, I think that's what they look like. In any case, it won't matter for this talk. Now, uh, um, you know, quantum computing sort of sounds on its face almost as, as crazy as those other things that I mentioned, right? If you've read almost anything about this in the popular press, it will say a quantum computer will work by just trying every possible solution in a different parallel universe or something like that. Okay, uh, and yet, you know, uh, as we know, you know, this is something that experimental groups all over the world, uh, you know, including many here in the UK, are actually working to build uh, right now. And, you know, and, and some of them are very optimistic that, you know, we'll get useful results within the next decade or so. Okay, so, uh, uh, so, so, so how could this be? What is really going on with quantum computing? Well, uh, you know, in fact, you know, it's, you know, in, I think in a very deep sense, it's less crazy than the other things. You know, still, still somewhat crazy, okay? But in order to uh, explain exactly how it's crazy and how not, uh, you need to say something about quantum mechanics, okay? So I have about five minutes to do that, <laughs> okay? So, you know, I think, you know, quantum mechanics uh, has uh, uh, somehow acquired a reputation for being complicated and hard. And, you know, I think, you know, I sort of blame the physicists, you know, I, I love the, you know, some of my best friends are physicists, I should say, okay? But, but they really, for almost a century, you know, since quantum mechanics uh, came into being in the 1920s, they really did quite a job at sort of convincing everyone that, you know, quantum mechanics requires this years of study of, you know, the ground state of, 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 of hydrogen and differential equations and the behavior of, uh, of, uh, of electrons and photons and, 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 and materials and so forth. Um, you know, I'm going to let you in on the secret, which is that quantum mechanics turns out to be incredibly simple once you take the physics out of it. Okay, so, you know, the way that I think about quantum mechanics is that it's barely even physics in the usual sense. You know, I mean, the physicists discovered it, you know, give them credit for that. Okay, but it's, it's, uh, it's more like an operating system that physics runs on as application software. Okay, it is a framework, you know, uh, of, uh, it's a mathematical framework that generalizes the usual rules of probability. That's what it is. Okay, and so, you know, I, you can summarize it as it is probability theory but with minus signs, which for some reason nature prefers. Okay, and uh, so, you know, so normally, you know, you would, uh, um, you know, you know I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you know, people go on and on about how Einstein couldn't accept that God plays dice, so forth, but, but if, 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 if the only thing about quantum mechanics were that it were probabilistic, that would be totally fine. 
That would not be what's mysterious about it, right? We use probability all the time. I mean, you use it at G Research, you know, to, to assess risks, right? You know, we talk about, let's say, you know, there's, a, uh, there's only a 10% probability that Trump will win the election or, you know, that Brexit will pass or this or that, right? You know, we, we use probability. Uh, uh, we, 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 we rely on it, you know, in our, in our day-to-day lives all the time, okay? But what we would never say is that, you know, there's a negative 30% chance of rain tomorrow, right? That would just be stupid, okay? But uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, we have to uh, assign events, you know, uh, uh, um, numbers called amplitudes, which could be positive or negative and, in fact, could even be complex numbers. Okay, so, uh, you know, Richard Feynman used to say that uh, everything about quantum mechanics is contained in this one double-slit experiment, okay, that uh, it's, j it's all just the same phenomenon over and over, okay? So this is the experiment first done around 1910 where you shoot photons one at a time at a screen with two slits in it. This is not the scale. And uh, you look at where the photon ends up on a second screen, and you collect st statistics about it. Okay, and what you find is that there are certain, you know, places where the photon is likely to appear. There are certain dark fringes where the photon is unlikely to appear. Okay, again, you know, who cares that much, right? There's some complicated physics thing going on, and sometimes the photon lands one place and sometimes it lands another. Okay, but now here's the weird part, okay? It's that you would think that whatever else the photon is doing, you know, it ought to obey the laws of probability. So in particular, I should say the probability that it will land at a given spot equals the probability that it go lands there having passed through the first slit plus the probability that it lands there having passed through the second slit. So in particular, if I close one of the slits, then that probability can only go down, right? It's not going to go up. Right? And yet that's not what you find. Okay? What you find is that actually decreasing the number of ways for something to happen can increase the chance that it happens. Okay? And the explanation that quantum mechanics gives for this um, is that uh, you, know, you, really, you have to think in terms of these amplitudes, these complex numbers. Okay, and you know the photon might uh, get to a spot uh, uh, um, uh, through uh, by one path, say the top path, with a positive amplitude, and it might get to the same spot by following a different path with a negative amplitude. And if that happens, then those two paths can, as we say, interfere destructively and cancel each other out. With the result being that the photon is never observed at that spot at all. Okay, whereas if you close off one of the slits, then the amplitude is a positive number or a negative number. Okay, and um, the rule is that uh, to find the probability of something happening, you take the squared absolute value of its probability. Okay, don't ask me, I didn't, I didn't make up the rules. Okay, but, uh, uh, but what that means is that you know, any, uh, you know, anything that happens with a non-zero amplitude has some probability of, of happening when you make a measurement. Okay, now the you know the even crazier part is that you know if you you know if you just reject all that and you say fine I'll just look at the at the photon and I'll just see which slit it's going through, then you see a different pattern here. Okay, you no longer see the interference, uh, you know these these these, these uh, fringes, and and then it just looks like yeah the photon goes through one slit or it goes through the other and then you know. Uh, uh, you know, and then, it, and, and then it does obey the rules of probability. Okay, it only stops obeying them when you're not looking, okay? You know, that's, that, that fact has sort of mi misled generations of people into saying, well, then consciousness must be fundamental to the universe, and it must be, you know, our act of looking at something that creates reality. You know, and tr truthfully, the way that Bohr and Heisenberg talked about quantum mechanics just encouraged that sort of language. Okay, but uh, the truth is it doesn't have to be a person looking to, that would destroy the interference pattern, okay? It could just as well be a mechanical recording device or, in fact, it could be any stray air molecule in the room that happens to carry away the information about which slit the photon went through, you know, and, and that would, as we say, decohere the quantum state of the photon. That would force it back to being a classical state, to being you know, one slit or the other slit, rather than a complex linear combination of the two. 
Okay, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. So, um, okay, so, so a bit more precisely, the key claim of quantum mechanics is that if you have any physical system whatsoever, and it can be in two states, which, you know, being computer scientists, I like to call zero or one, okay, and this notation, you know, the, these asymmetrical brackets, these are called Dirac cats, so I use them as sort of a concession to the physicists. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, you actually do get used to them, they're nice. But, uh, 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 you know, then, then that system that could be in these two states, zero or one, like for an example, an electron that could be in its ground state or in its first excited state, you know, a photon that could be polarized uh, horizontally or polarized vertically, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter w uh, what thing we're talking about. Whatever it is, it can also be in a superposition of the two states which means a complex linear combination, A0 and B1, where A and B are complex numbers, amplitudes, that satisfy uh, absolute value of A squared plus absolute value of B squared equals one. Okay, so if uh, you know, we restricted to real amplitudes only for simplicity, then the possible states of one quantum bit or one qubit, as we say, are simply define a circle. Okay, on the horizontal, we have the zero state, on the vertical, we have the one state. Okay, so, so orthogonal means perfectly distinguishable in quantum mechanics. And then, uh, you know, in between, we can have combinations of the two, like zero plus one over square root of two, an equal superposition of zero and one. If I now measure this thing, I ask it whether it's zero or one, then half the time I'll see zero and half the time I'll see one. And whichever choice nature makes, it will stick with that choice from that point on. So if it decides that it's one, and I look again, then it will still be one, okay? Um, I've now forced it down to one or the other. Okay, if the uh, uh, qubit was over here, and I asked it, is it zero or one, then most of the time it will say that it's one, and only occasionally will it say that it's zero. Okay, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, the probability is given by the absolute square of the amplitude. Okay, and now, so then that, that is what happens to a quantum state when you look at it, when you make a measurement and force it to decide or it's to be. Now, when you're not looking, then this list of amplitudes just has a life of its own, okay? It has a thing that it does in private, okay? And, uh, 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 and, and, and then that thing can be sort of taking the list of amplitudes, which we'll think of as a big vector, and multiplying it by any matrix that, preserve, that has to preserve the two norms. So it has to preserve that the sum of the absolute squares of the amplitudes is one, because otherwise the probabilities wouldn't add up to one, right? So a matrix that maps unit vectors to other unit vectors we call a unitary matrix, okay? And any such matrix is formally allowed by the rules of quantum mechanics. Okay, so to take a simple example, uh, I could have a qubit in the zero state, that corresponds to this vector here, and then I could apply this two by two unitary matrix over here, which corresponds to just grabbing a vector and rotating it 45 degrees counterclockwise in the plane. Okay, so if I do that once, I get an equal superposition of zero and one. You know, if I do it a second time, then I get definitely one. Okay, and if I did it a third time, then I would get minus zero plus one, you know, and so forth. Then I would get minus zero, which is actually physically the same state as just zero, because multiplying through everything by the same amplitude doesn't change anything. Okay, and then I would get down to the superposition again, and then back to the one state, and so forth. Okay, so another way to understand what's happening is in terms of interference of amplitudes. So the first time I apply this unitary, uh, it maps zero to an equal superposition of zero and one. Uh, it's like this column here. And then when I do it again, uh, by linearity, zero goes to zero plus one, and one goes to now minus zero plus one. Okay, so now if I ask what is the amplitude for getting back to the zero state, I have to add up these two contributions, one from this path and one from that path, right? But one of them's positive and the other one is negative, and so they interfere, they cancel each other out, and zero is never observed. And uh, if I look for the amplitude for the one state, then I have two positive contributions, so they interfere constructively, and I add those up and I get 
you know, all of the amplitude on the one state, which, you know, indeed is what I observe when I look, okay? So everything in quantum mechanics boils down to choreographing these patterns of interference. Okay, so now what is a quantum computer in particular? Okay, well, if I have, let's say, not just one, but uh, a thousand of these qubits, then the rules of quantum mechanics say that for every one of the two to the thousandth, you know, possible settings of, 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 of zeros and ones to all thousand of those qubits, uh, I, in general, need another amplitude. Okay, so uh, to maintain the state of, let's say, e just a thousand measly particles, each of which could be spinning up or spinning down, let's say, nature, off to the side somewhere, has to maintain some scratch paper with two to the thousandth power complex numbers. Okay, that, that's actually many more numbers than there are uh, particles in the observable universe. Okay, uh, mere 10 to the 85. Okay, and any time something happens to the particles, okay, unitary transformation, nature has to erase all of those numbers and replace them with new numbers. Okay, so, you know, that seems like a staggering amount of effort for nature to be going to just to maintain the state of a few particles. Now, you know, so we would have, a, in general, with n qubits, we have a superposition over two to the n uh, possible outcomes. So a vector of two to the n complex numbers, which, which we write like this. Okay, now, uh, in some sense, you know, chemists and physicists uh, knew this for decades. They knew it mostly as a practical problem. Okay, when you're trying to simulate quantum mechanics with a classical computer, you know, the, the uh, say, to uh, learn what is the reaction rate of your favorite chemical reaction, something like that, the uh, time needed by our best simulations in general takes time that increases exponentially with the number of particles involved. Okay, and this is why, actually, a significant percentage of supercomputing resources uh, uh, in the world today are used to just try to do quantum mechanical simulations, right? You know, th 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 this is the reason, because it's such a computationally intensive process. Um, you know, I understand that at, at UT Austin, we have a supercomputer called Stampede, and uh, about 30% of its time is used for uh, quantum chemistry. Okay, but uh, now it was not until the early 80s that a few physicists like uh, uh, David Deutsch uh, uh, and uh, Richard Feynman uh, started asking, well, could we turn this computational lemon into lemonade? Okay, that is, why, why shouldn't we build computers that themselves would, uh, you know, exploit this principle of uh, superposition and that themselves could take advantage of this interference phenomenon, right, if it's, if it's so hard to simulate with our existing computers. Okay, now, of course, they then face the question, well, supposing you built such a device, what would it be good for? Now, Feynman was only able to give one answer to that question, which is that such a computer would be good for simulating quantum mechanics. Okay, now, you know, as tautological as that sounds, if we actually get practical, scalable quantum computers, that's, I think that's actually the most important commercial application of them that we know about today. You know, that's something that's enormous for uh, um, designing high eff efficiency solar cells, uh, you know, designing new drugs potentially, designing um, high temperature superconductors, sort of any problem, you know, in, in chemistry or solid state physics involving lots of interacting components and where it's important to get the quantum effects right. Okay, you know, that this, you know, this is, uh, you know, if, if you told me that quantum computing had changed the world, you know, 30 years from now, that would be my guess as to how. Okay, but uh, the discovery that really excited people about this field was not that. It was a discovery by uh, Peter Shore a little more than 20 years ago that a quantum computer can sometimes be coaxed into solving even classical problems much faster than we know how to solve them with a classical computer. Okay, and the most famous example of that is factoring integers. Okay, so he discovered, sh what Shor discovered was that there is an algorithm using a quantum computer uh, that factors an n-digit integer using only about n-squared steps, n-squared elementary operations, by, you know, which in the quantum case means unitary transformations that you perform on just w one or two of the qubits at a time. Okay, so, uh, uh, he sh so, so uh, you know, fa the factoring problem is of interest 
course, to mathematicians. It's also of interest to lots of other people. Okay, you know this is this is why you know the NSA, uh, you know, and I guess the GCHQ now fund you know a good deal of work in quantum computing. Okay, because uh, if you know quantum computing becomes practical, then it changes the whole landscape of uh, uh, public key cryptography. Okay, uh, almost all of the public key crypto systems that we use today become broken. Uh, there are some other public key crypto systems uh, under development now, such as lattice-based ones, that we don't know how to break, even with quantum computers. Okay, although people are working on that. Okay, uh, uh, you know, and then and then and then there's private key cryptography, which would mo mostly not be that affected by quantum computing. Okay, and then there's there's uh, 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 ironically enough quantum cryptography. Okay, which would you know, uh, uh, you know, be uh, unbreak, you know, has the promise of being unbreakable just according to the laws of physics. Okay, so uh, but the bottom line is that if quantum computing becomes practical, even if it looks like it might become practical in the relatively near future, then we all need to switch to other forms of cryptography. Okay, so where are we in terms of actually realizing this? Well, some of you may have heard, you know, uh, uh, you know, the progress has been tremendously impressive. I mean, after a few billion dollars of investment and maybe, you know, uh, 20 years or so of serious experimental work in this field, we're now at a point where quantum computers using Shor's algorithm have factored 21 into 3 times 7 uh, with high statistical confidence. Okay, uh, you know, I think 35 could be on the horizon. Uh, now, look, scaling this up is an incredibly hard problem, you know, and, you know, the, 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 the thing that makes it hard was actually understood since the beginning. Uh, it's, it's this effect of decoherence that, you know, you should imagine the rest of the universe is constantly trying to measure the quantum computer and carry away information about its state. And any time that happens, then you lose the superposition properties, okay? You lose the interference. Then your computer just reverts back to having a classical state, and so you don't see the speed up anymore. Okay, so, uh, uh, so what that means is that if you wanted to build a practical quantum computer, uh, then on the one hand, you have to keep it incredibly well isolated from its external environment. Okay, this is why a, lo a lot of quantum computing experiments, you know, start by cooling everything down to, you know, 10 millikelvin or something, okay? Not all of them, but, you know, if you go to a lot of quantum computing labs, you know, the most conspicuous thing you'll see is a gigantic dilution refrigerator, okay? Uh, and, um, you know, and then you'll see a computer monitor with some kind of blurry pictures and they'll, you know, and, m and my experimental friends will tell me this is where the ions are that store the qubits. And, you know, of, of course I'll believe them, you know, it could be, you know, it could be anything. But, uh, 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 you know, but, you know, that this is, you know, how, how we verify this is actually a very interesting question itself. Okay, but, um, uh, but, but, you know, you have to keep it incredibly well isolated, uh, but then at the same point, at time, the qubits have to be talking to each other, right, in order to do the computation. Okay, and this poses such a severe challenge that there were physicists in the 90s who said this is fundamentally impossible. This can just never happen in principle. And, um, you know, what, what convinced most physicists that it is merely a gigantic engineering problem, you know, and that there is no fundamental obstacle to this, was a discovery in the 90s called the quantum fault tolerance theorem. Okay, and what that basically said is that you don't have to get the decoherence down to zero. Okay, it's enough to get it down to some very low, but, you know, but finite point, and then uh, you can actually protect the qubits that you care about in a non-local way using very, very clever error correcting codes in such a way that if any, let's say 1% of your physical qubits become lost or decohere, you know, or are measured by the environment, the quantum information that you want can still be recovered from the remaining qubits. Okay, so the challenge since then has been to get qubits that work reliably enough that you can start applying these error correcting codes and that you actually improve things by doing that rather than making them worse. Okay, and we're not quite at that point yet, but the experimentalists are a hell of a lot closer than they were 15 or 20 years ago or even than they were five years ago. Okay, so, uh, you know, I think that if, if, if civilization lasts long enough, then this should eventually happen, you know. 
uh, how long? Uh, you know, well, you know, uh, uh, you guys are in the betting business, not me. All right. So, um, uh, so uh, you know, so I should say something about you know how do quantum computers change the theory of computation, which is my main interest here. Okay. So I showed you this br little world map before of you know p, n p, the n p complete problems as the sort of holy grail on top. You know, where does quantum fit in? Well, you know, in computer science, we're happy to take any concept, you know, no matter how amazing, and give it an inscrutable sequence of capital letters. Okay, so this is what my advisor at Berkeley did, Ume Umesh Fazarani, and he defined the class BQP for bounded error quantum polynomial time. This is like the quantum generalization of the class P. This is all the decision problems that are efficiently solvable using a quantum computer you know, with uh, only a small chance of an error, let's say, right? Because if your computer factored numbers, say, 80% of the time, you know, that, that, that's outstanding, right? If it doesn't succeed, just run it again, you know, until it does. Okay, so, uh, so that's this class BQP. What do we know about it? Well, it certainly contains P, a quantum computer, if nothing else, can simulate a classical one. Okay, uh, you know, and then Shor showed that BQP contains factoring which is something that, you know, at the very least, we, uh, we've invested a lot of money in it not being in P. Okay, you know, you know no, no, no one really knows for sure if it's there or not, but, you know, uh, if, if P were equal to BQP, then Shor tells us that factoring also has to be in P, which would be a revolutionary development. Okay, so by the way, I drew BQP with this wavy boundary because everything quantum is, you know, spooky and weird. Okay, but uh, you know, and and you know, and the truth is, after you know, after twenty, you know, twenty three years of studying this class, you know, there's still a lot that we don't know about it. So you could you you know you could uh, naturally ask, does BQP contain all of NP? So does it contain the NP complete problem? Right, that's a very obvious question. We still you know we don't know the answer. Okay, now naturally, you know, can, can we prove that, that BQP does not contain NP complete problems? Well, of course we can't prove that because we can't even prove that P doesn't contain NP complete problems, right? That's P versus NP problem, okay? But, um, you know, it would be a great surprise to most of us if, if NP were contained in BQP. So that's why I drew the picture the way that I did, right? Quantum computing seems to give you a speed up for some very special problems like factoring by exploiting very special structure that those problems have. But uh, for, for arbitrary problems in NP, you know, even a quantum computer may still need exponential time to solve them. Okay, well, we, well, we can come back to that. Okay, and then, you know, on, on the other side, you could ask, uh, is BQP contained in NP? Or in other words, for every problem that a quantum computer can solve, is there at least a short classical proof you know, that it could present of, of what the answer is, right? Well, factoring is like that, right? Factoring is an NP problem. So if someone builds a quantum computer and they use it to factor 10,000 digit numbers, then I can go to one of my friends in computer science who don't even believe in quantum mechanics or don't even believe in physics at all. I, you know, I have such friends, okay? And I can say, well, here are the factors of your number. So, you know, suck on that, right? Um, Okay, with, uh, um, uh, you know, but, but there might be BQP problems, you know, that, uh, 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 you know, that don't have that property where a quantum computer could solve them, but the only way to verify the answer would be using another quantum computer. Okay, so, so as I said, you know, we, uh, you know, an important point is that we, need, you know, we don't think that factoring is NP complete. In fact, if factoring is NP complete, then a lot of complexity classes come collapsing that, that shouldn't collapse. Okay, so it's probably not. And, um, you know, not surprisingly, we can't prove that BQP can't solve the NP complete problem, but here's what we do know. Okay, so uh, Bennett, Bernstein, Brassard, and Vazirani in, in, uh, in the 90s uh, proved this very important theorem that says if you take away the structure of an NP-complete problem and you just think about it as like an abstract black box, say like here's two to the n possible solutions, and for each solution I can, I can check whether it's valid or not valid, Okay, but now I'm a quantum computer, so I can check this for all of the solutions in superposition. Um, 
you know, that's still not enough, right? You know, even, the, even a quantum computer is going to need at least about two to the n over two power steps. Okay, so, so you'll notice that's about the square root of the number of steps that you would have needed with a classical computer, right? Classically, you would, you would have just had to examine all two to the n possible solutions, you know, under the assumptions that I gave you. Okay, quantumly, you can beat that by a little. You can beat it by a square root, okay, but not by more than that without sort of exploiting, without opening up the black box and exploiting the problem structure. So, uh, so that square root speed up turns out to actually be achievable using a quantum algorithm called Grover's algorithm, which is probably the second most important quantum algorithm after Shor's. So Grover's algorithm has extremely wide application. You know, it works for like any optimization or machine learning uh, uh, pro or combinatorial search problem or anything like that, where you just have a whole space of possibilities that you're trying to, to narrow down. Okay, but it does not give you an exponential speed up. It merely gives you a quadratic speed up. Okay, so um, that's the trade-off. And, you know, and, and, and if you want, you know, if you're still wondering about, you know, then why do the popular articles say, well, a quantum computer could just try every possible answer in parallel? Well, you know, that, that's like, that's sort of true, right? What, you know, you can with a quantum computer very easily create a superposition over all the possible solutions to your problem. The trouble is at some point you've got to measure the thing if you want to see an answer, right? And if I just measured an equal superposition over all the possible answers, not having done anything else, then all I'm going to see will be a random answer. Okay, and of course, if I just wanted a random answer, well, I could have picked one myself with a lot less trouble. Okay, so the only hope of getting a speed advantage with a quantum computer is really to choreograph a pattern of interference. Okay, so the game in quantum algorithm design is always that, you know, you, like, for each wrong answer, some paths leading to the wrong answer should have a positive amplitude and others should have a negative amplitude so that on the whole they cancel each other out. Whereas the paths leading to the right answer should be in phase with each other. Let's say all positive or all negative. Now if I can arrange that, and if I can do it despite not knowing in advance which answer is the right one, you know, which is the tricky part, okay, then uh, when I measure, then I'll see the right answer, or at least with high probability. Okay, uh, you know, and so, so that is what Shor showed how to do for the factoring problem. You know, he had to exploit very special structure in factoring, the fact that it's reducible to a different problem called order finding, which is solvable using a quantum, uh, you know, version of the Fourier transform, okay, which in turn he showed how the, uh, could be implemented efficiently with a quantum computer. Okay, if it were just this matter of trying every possible divisor in a different parallel universe, well, then you wouldn't have needed sure to think of it. Okay, so, um, okay, but anyway, uh, the, the bottom line from all, all of this is that if there were a fast quantum algorithm to solve the NP-complete problems, which would be like the real holy grail in, in the subject, then uh, it would have to exploit their structure somehow, just like a fast classical algorithm would have to. Okay, it's going to have to be fundamentally different from Shor's algorithm. Okay, so there is a, an important proposal for a quantum algorithm that would try to solve NP-complete problems by exploiting their structure. And this is what's called the adiabatic algorithm, which was proposed by my former uh, colleagues at MIT, uh, such as Ed Farhi, uh, around 2000. Okay, and since then, they've spent 16 years just trying to understand what this algorithm does. Okay, so, uh, uh, but the, the basic idea of it is that you, you start out by, like, applying a Hamiltonian, which is just, like, the continuous time version of a unitary transformation. Okay, and you, you apply one with a very simple and easy to prepare uh, uh, lowest energy state or a ground state. Okay, and so if I just keep applying h sub i, then my system will just sit there in its ground state forever. But now I slowly vary the Hamiltonian to one whose lowest energy state encodes the solution to an NP hard problem of interest to me. Okay, and, and actually such a Hamiltonian is very easy to construct. That's not the hard part here. Okay, and now there's a theorem called the adiabatic theorem, which assures me that if I vary this Hamiltonian slowly enough, 
then my, the state of my system will always track the ground state, which means that it will end up in the ground state of H sub f, which means that by measuring it, I get the answer to my NP complete problem. Okay, so from this point of view, the only que remaining question is how slowly do I need to vary the Hamiltonian in order to make sure that I stay in the ground state? Okay, that's the key question. Okay, now some of you may know there is a company uh, outside of Vancouver called D-Wave uh, that uh, has been claiming for a decade to already have practical quantum computers. You know, they actually sold a few of them, uh, one of them to Lockheed Martin, another one to Google. Uh, this is a picture of it. I've walked inside of it. It's literally a giant black box. But you know you can you can go inside. It's it's mostly you know refrigeration again and you know space for a, an engineer to fiddle with stuff. Um, you know so their current model has about 2,000 uh, superconducting qubits, uh, and the whole thing is just uh, designed from the beginning only to run some approximation to this adiabatic algorithm. That's the only thing it's for. Okay, they don't even try to do Shor's algorithm or you know other other quantum algorithms. Okay, and um, you know and and uh, they published a lot of claims that you know that they could get speed ups for real world problems already. You know you, you may know they were on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, they uh, uh, you know it said you know the coldest place in the universe, which is you know not remotely true, but uh, and anyway you know they went all, you know on and on about this and uh, you know and. Uh, um, you know, now be because they sold a couple of their machines, um, you know, we actually know a lot more about what is going on with them than uh, we did a few years ago. So, you know, a, you know, you can read the whole complicated debate about it on my blog, if, you, if you'd like, or at least my side of it. But, uh, uh, you know, a very, very short summary would be, uh, yes, uh, you know, this machine does solve you know, some optimization problem, basically like finding its own ground state, you know, if you program in the couplings. So, you know, it, it, it does a reasonable job at solving some special optimization problems. Um, you know, and it's, a, it's sort of an impressive piece of uh, systems engineering to just, you know, make that work at all. Uh, yes, there are quantum effects that are relevant, you know, at the, certainly at the scale of one qubit at a time, and probably at the scale of, you know, uh, these cute clusters of eight qubits that they build the thing out of. We don't know whether there's quantum entanglement and like a collective quantum behavior am among, you know, w larger numbers of qubits. There might be. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, the current devices uh, are not doing anything faster than we could do them with a classical computer, if you make a fair comparison, okay? Uh, and, you know, Every time there's been a claim to the contrary, it has turned out on examination that the classical computer's hands were tied behind its back. Okay, that uh, the comparison was like, you know, D-Wave versus a, you know, a classical algorithm that we know is very far from the best one, you know, and that's, you know, and that, and it like has to work way harder than the, you know, you know, the, you know, the, you know, and, and you know, once you, once you make the comparison fair, then your laptop, you know, your, you know, your laptop does about as good a job of simulating this machine as the machine does of simulating itself. Okay, uh, you know, and it doesn't seem like a scaling issue, right? From what we can tell now, it doesn't seem like this going to 2,000 or 4,000 or 8,000 qubits will change the situation appreciably, uh, which, you know, is actually what many of us said from the very beginning, not that anyone in the press listened to us. Okay, but, uh, uh, but uh, well, you know, what, what seems to be needed is actually qubits of a much higher quality, okay? And in fact, even if you had perfect qubits, you know, again, we still don't really know what kind of speed up, you know, you can hope for, for NP-complete problems, right? The adiabatic algorithm is fundamentally unlike Shor's algorithm in that respect. Okay, uh, but you know, but but uh, but even if there is a speed up, you know, we don't think that these qubits are yet at a good enough quality to see it. And D-Wave has not been, you know, has not been pursuing error correction or the things that most of the field thinks are going to be needed to get qubits with good enough quality. Although they may be starting to do that now. 
Okay, so you know, so the so what was the hope with this adiabatic algorithm? Well, the hope was to exploit what's called quantum tunneling behavior. Okay, where uh, you know a classical algorithm might get stuck at this local minimum over here, but depending on the exact height and width of this barrier, you know, a quantum algorithm could sort of you know just get over the hump, you know, because of what's called quantum tunneling, which is like the reason why the sun shines, for example, you know, why fusion works. Okay, and uh, um, you know now now the the main problem is that whether this tunneling happens or doesn't happen uh, depends on what's called the minimum eigenvalue gap of the Hamiltonian as you vary it, and you know you the smaller this gap is, the longer you have to run the adiabatic algorithm for. And again, this is even if unlike D-Wave, you have a perfect quantum computer. Okay, so, so now if this gap is exponentially small, then you've got to run your algorithm for exponential time. And indeed, when you look at hard NP-complete problems numerically, you find that this gap can get very small. Okay, so uh, Farhi uh, told me the wonderful story that he once you know, went to an expert in condensed matter physics because they have decades of experience of studying these spectral gaps for their own reasons. And he said to the expert, you know, based on your experience, do you think that in our system this gap is going to decrease polynomially or exponentially as a function of the number of particles? And the expert thought about it a while, and then he said, I think it will decrease exponentially. Okay, now that was not the answer that far he wanted to hear. Okay, so he said, why? What's the physical reason for it? And the guy thought about it some more, and he said, well, it's because otherwise your algorithm would work. I, I think there's actually something deep here, right? That, uh, uh, you know, after you've, you've seen enough different attempts to solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time, just hit a snag at the last minute, you may say nature is trying to tell us something, okay? You may say, you know, maybe the hardness of NP-complete problems, something that we ought to adopt as a principle, you know, akin to the impossibility of faster than light signaling, or the second law of thermodynamics, and then we ought to see what it implies or explains about other problems. Okay, so um, yeah, so so I think you know it remains very much an open question whether you can get a speed up using uh, the quantum adiabatic algorithm over the best classical algorithms, which is of any practical importance. And, you know, in theory, can only get us so far here. We might just have to build a quantum computer and test it out before we know for sure. Okay, so I have some slides about my own research, but you know what, you know, I, I don't know if anyone cares about my own research, and I'm, I'm out of time anyway. But uh, I, uh, uh, you know, uh, one thing I've been working on is how to get a clear quantum speed up for some task. Uh, uh, you know, not necessarily a useful task, just some task, okay? Uh, John Martinez, who now works at Google, has the best superconducting qubits in the world, and they're trying to scale to uh, 40 or 50 of them, they say within the next year or two. Okay, we, you know, we'll see if that happens. If they manage to do that, uh, you know, that's probably still not enough to do anything useful, but uh, that's, you know, we, that, that may be enough to do something that's hard. <laughs> Okay, and thereby sort of do you know what for me has always been the number one application of quantum computing, which is just to disprove the people who say quantum computing is impossible. Okay, and so this goal of just proving a quantum advantage for something uh, has gone by the name quantum supremacy. Although uh, now people are sort of backing away from that name for for reasons that you can guess. Okay, but uh, um, but uh, but but you know, but but this is one of the main things I've been working on. How would we actually demonstrate this clear quantum advantage? Um, you know, we had a proposal, my student and I, called boson sampling, which has actually been experimentally demonstrated uh, uh, just a, a couple years ago, with uh, so far with six photons by a group in Bristol. Um, to get a clear advantage over a classical computer, you're going to want to scale it up to about 30 photons. You know, and that's hard, but there are a lot of ideas on the table for how to do it. Okay, more recently, uh, quantum computing ideas have even shown up in the study of the black hole information problem. So, um, you know, we all know Stephen Hawking discovered that black holes radiate, they're not completely black. When the mass of our sun would radiate away in a mere 10 to the 67 years. Okay, but then a, a few years ago, there was something called the firewall paradox, 
which said that uh, uh, you know you could there's some experiment that you could imagine doing on the Hawking radiation, uh, which you know you'd have to wait 10 to the 67 years. You'd have to have a very long grant. Okay, but uh, eventually, you know, you could do something so severe to the Hawking radiation that if you then later jumped into the black hole to see what happened, you would encounter an end of space time already at the event horizon, long before you would hit the singularity. So this is what the physicists call the firewall. Okay, uh, so this was a big, you know, this was big news. You know, this was a big deal in the string theory world. Okay, now, uh, you know, so what gives? Well, you know, an amazing proposal was put forward by uh, Daniel Harlow and Patrick Hayden in 2013. And what they said is that, well, if you look at what kind of quantum computation would need to be done on the Hawking radiation to create this effect, you would need to solve one of these problems that we think are exponentially hard even for a quantum computer. Okay, so you would run up against the limits of quantum computing that I've been talking about, which means you, know, you could not do it in a mere 10 to the 67 years. You would need more like 2 to the 10 to the 67 years. Okay, by which point, you know, the black hole would have long, long ago evaporated anyway. So maybe there's nothing to jump into and there's no problem. Right, uh, so uh, so that's you know another uh, th this con amazing connection you know uh, between quantum uh, b between quantum gravity and the limits of quantum computing, which is you know my sort of subject has sort of forced get given me no choice but to become interested in this as well. So uh, to summarize, when quantum computers are the most powerful kind of computer allowed by the currently known laws of physics. Uh, you know, they, you know, anything more powerful will have to exploit as yet undiscovered physics. Okay, there is at least a realistic hope of building them in the foreseeable future and getting some advantage that way. You know, contrary to what you read in the popular press, even quantum computers would face limitations. They would not be uber computers that instantly did everything. Okay, but those limits have a positive side. For example, they might help to protect the geometry of space-time. All right, so thank you for your attention. Uh, um, yeah. okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. and I'm, I'm sorry that I went over. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Really mm -hmm. fa fantastically scintillating talk. Um, we actually do have quite a number of questions, and, and they do keep coming here, so this, this app is just <laughs> superb. Okay. Uh, let me just if, anyone, uh, if anyone wants to leave, I won't be offended or anything. Don't worry about that, but yeah. <laughs> no, you've actually uh, answered some of the questions here already. Uh, okay. So, somebody was scolding you about D-Wave about halfway through the talk yeah, already, so yeah, they must I, have I mean, known something. I mean, I mean, I know there's going to be the D-Wave question. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> anyway, I think the, um, as far as I can see, the most upvoted question um, is, is so far is the, uh, just whether you can give a high-level overview of why the proof is so difficult that p is probably not equal to np. Ah, okay, that, that, that is an excellent question, uh, one, of, one of my favorites. So, uh, uh, so why is it so hard to prove that p is not equal to np? Okay, well, you know, the, the first thing to say is that proving a negative tends to be difficult, right? Because, you know, we're not asking, you know, can, can you think of an algorithm, right? We're asking, you know, prove that, that no fast algorithm will ever be discovered for, you know, for this whole class of problems. And now the difficulty is, you know, there are lots and lots of problems where it looks at first like there's not an efficient algorithm, but if you just slightly change the way you think about the problem, then there is one. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a linear programming, you know, something, you know, maybe some of you work with, okay, is something, it was not obvious that if that would be solvable in polynomial time, it turns out that it is. Okay, deciding whether a number is prime or composite. You know, an example I mentioned, if you do it the obvious way, uh, that, that too would need exponential time, but there are much, much cleverer ways to go about it, um, you know, you, using some knowledge of number theory. Okay, even factoring, while we don't know how to solve factoring in polynomial time with a classical computer, we do know how to solve it in time that grows exponentially with the cube root of the size of the number. Okay, that uses something called the number field sieve. You know, it is, um, uh, by, you know, from the Snowden documents, it is our best current guess for what the NSA is doing with the high performance, you know, computing uh, that, it, that, it, that it surely has. Uh, you know, so, so it's a very important algorithm for cryptography. Okay, it uses elliptic curve theory. 
right? So if you didn't know about elliptic curves, you know, you might say, well, two, you know, obviously factoring should take two to the n times, okay? But you would be wrong, okay? So, you know, in fact, you know, like you might say the p versus np problem is not actually that hard because I get a solution to it in my inbox about every week, okay? I'll get, you know, either a proof p equals, p equals np, that it doesn't equal np, that p is not even contained in np, that the question is independent of, you know, the axioms of set theory. You know, I've seen it all, okay? But, um, you know, but, but the people who claim to prove P is not equal to NP, you know, like, like they always do some kind of complicated manipulations that you can't really follow, but then at the end of the day, there's always this step where you say, okay, well, there's two to the N possible solutions. Obviously, an algorithm has to examine each one, and so that's gonna take two to the N time. You know, and the trouble is if that, type of argument work, then it would also work for these other problems that we know are solvable in polynomial time. So that kind of argument just cannot be valid. Okay, now there's much, much more that you can say about this question. Like you could say, you know, well, didn't Turing prove that the halting problem is unsolvable, right? So, you know, well, you know, indeed he did. So couldn't we use that same style of argument, that sort of self-referential, you know, Gerdelian encoding trick to uh, prove P not equal to NP? Well, in fact, mathematicians tried to do that in the 1970s. And eventually they hit up against something called the relativization barrier that explains why techniques borrowed from mathematical logic, things like diagonalization, cannot work to resolve P versus NP. You will have to go much deeper than that. Okay, then people uh, in the 1980s got very excited about techniques from combinatorics. They thought that maybe a proof of P not equal to NP was just around the corner. And then in the 1990s, uh, two people named Razbarov and Rudich discovered a second barrier called the natural proofs barrier that explained why these combinatorial techniques from the 80s also could not work to prove P not equal to NP. They actually proved something mind boggling, okay? They proved that if these techniques work, then as they proved NP-complete problems to be harder and harder, they would also show them to be easier and easier, okay? Until at some point, like, they, you could not go beyond it without proving a lower bound that was better than the upper bound, you know, that was higher than the upper bound, right? Which would, which would be an absurdity. Okay, so, uh, uh, so then that was out, and, you know, then around, you know, 2000, people came up with techniques that, you know, overcame both of those barriers simultaneously, then uh, a decade ago, Avi Wigderson and I uh, discovered a third barrier, uh, which is called the algebraization barrier. So this is sort of my, my only real contribution to the P versus NP problem proper, right? What the algebraization barrier explained is why even the techniques that had gotten around the, the last two barriers are still not gonna resolve P versus NP, okay? And so, you know, it's an enormous question. Now, I think that we do know more about it than we did, say, in the 70s. You know, and there are, uh, there's amazing work by Ryan Williams at Stanford that has actually gotten around all three of the known barriers, uh, you know, very, quite recently. There is uh, work by a guy named Keitan Momoli that tries to reduce P, P versus NP and other such questions to questions about uh, uh, representation theory and algebraic geometry, which Momoli believes, you know, could be solved in a mere hundred years. Okay, uh, this is what those, at least that's what he told me. Okay, uh, but um, um, you know it is uh, uh, an, an absolutely enormous question. I you know I do think it could eventually be solved, just like Fermat's last theorem was eventually solved, right? But that one took 350 years. Okay, and it required the creation of entire fields of mathematics that did not exist at the time that uh, Fermat posed the question, uh, or, or mistake rather mistakenly thought he had solved it. Okay, and uh, you know, we, have, we, we see every indication that the P versus NP problem is something similar. You know, it re it's going to require, you know, uh, 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 whole swaths of new mathematics to be developed. And you know, there are, you know, the important thing to say, like when we see anyone claiming to, to have solved it, is that there are a thousand times easier questions than P versus NP that we already don't know how to solve. Okay, so if someone claims to have solved it, just ask, you know, as a warm-up if they've solved one of those easier questions. Okay, ask, you know, ask if they've proven that, that NX is not in TC0. You can tell them that I asked, uh, asked them to, 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 to tell you that, okay?
Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, I'm, I'm picking it up because it's yeah. rather beautifully phrased, is, um, and I quote verbatim here, if there was funding on the level of CERN or a rather mm -hmm. large wall, uh, could quicker progress be made on quantum computing, I presume? If so, why is it not happening? All right, well, the answer to the first question is absolutely. Yeah, we could always do with more funding. <laughs> okay? Uh, no, I mean, I think that, that, that actually, you know, you can make an analogy to, let's say, the situation of nuclear fission in the 1930s, right, where people knew, people understood, you know, physicists understood at least that a fission bomb was possible in principle. Uh, Niels Bohr famously said, well, well, it may be possible in principle, but it will never happen in reality because, you know, in order to build one, you would basically have to convert an entire nation into a uranium enrichment factory. Okay, then in 1942, he was... Uh, after he escaped Denmark, he was shown the Manhattan Project, and he said, well, I see that that's what you've done. Okay, so, uh, you know, so, so, so sometimes, you know, we, you know, I mean, I mean, like, like, I, I, I find it so much easier to say what a quantum computer could or couldn't do once we do have it than to say when we will have it, because the answer to when we will have it depends on all sorts of political and social factors that I have no special skill at predicting. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, it depends, obviously, on, you know, whether civilization continues. You know, it depends on, uh, uh, you know, which, you know, I don't regard as certain, okay? It depends on, uh, you know, how much someone chooses to spend on this, uh, you know, and um, I think that, you know, if, some, if there were some nation, state, or corporation that put $100 billion into it, then yes, absolutely, that would accelerate progress. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, Google, you know, has put some tens of millions of dollars into it, you know, into John Martinez's group, and that has indeed accelerated progress, you know, very visibly just within the last few years. Okay, Microsoft is now, you know, you know, announced just a month ago that they're starting a very serious effort. You know, IBM has an effort, and so, uh, um, you know, I think that, you know, that, you know, like how badly does someone want it, and how much are they willing to spend? you know, that, that certainly does affect it. I mean, some billions of dollars have been spent on it, but, you know, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the case for building, even if there were zero applications of a quantum computer, I like to say that the case for building one is at least as strong as the case for building the Large Hadron Collider, right? Just to, you know, see that, yes, the laws of physics work in this regime, you know, that this is possible at all, I think would be, you know, a major advance for the human race. And is you know, and to me, any of the applications are just are just icing on the cake. Okay, that that's that's that, that's all they are. Okay, but uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, when people think of it purely in terms of applications, then they may say, well, once they understand that the applications are not quite as impressive or as wide ranging as the popular press leads you to believe, then they may say, well, then why bother to build it? So that's always the you know the sort of argument that I'm you know having to have about this. Um, I think the, uh, the next question came in uh, yeah. quite early on, um, which is, I, th I think, by the way, we probably have time for another two questions or All something, right. so this is probably the uh, second to last one, okay. uh, which I find quite, quite interesting. Um, mm -hmm. uh, basically, somebody's been asking whether there are any NP-hard public key encryption schemes ah. or if there's any progress towards such. Okay, well, that, 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 that is yet another uh, excellent question. And, uh, you know, excellent because, uh, you know, I, 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 I wish that, you know, I was able to give a, 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 a good answer to it. But, uh, you know, whether you can base public key cryptography, or for that matter, even private key cryptography, on an NP complete problem, that is on the mere assumption that P is not equal to NP, has been one of the great questions of theoretical cryptography since the 1970s. Okay, and we, we still, you know, do not know how to do that. You know, there are crypto systems that are based on what looks like an NP-complete problem, but if you examine it, you will invariably find that the, uh, that the, that the crypto system is based on some special case of the NP-complete problem, and the belief in the, that the crypto system is secure is always stronger than the mere belief that P is not equal to NP, right? It always requires you to stick your neck out further and make some additional assumption, which might fail even I assuming P is not equal to NP. Okay, now why is that? Well, there are a few reasons. 
The first reason is that P not equal to NP is a worst case conjecture. Okay, it only says that there's gonna be no algorithm that solves every instance of you know, your NP complete problem in polynomial time. Okay, but if there were you know, an algorithm that could break a crypto system, let's say 90% of the time, well, that's still a pretty bad crypto system, <laughs> okay? It doesn't, you know, it's cold comfort that there was some key that couldn't be broken, you know, if your key has been broken, okay? So, for, so, so what that means is that if you want a secure crypt, uh, crypto system, you know, based on complexity theory, then uh, more than P not equal to NP, you need, average, you need NP problems that are hard in the average case. Okay, and that, as far as we know today, is a stronger uh, 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 hypothesis. And then secondly, you need to be able to generate hard instances of this NP problem while also knowing yourself the answer to the problem. Like, you, the generator, have to know the decryption key. So then you need something even a little stronger, which we call a one-way function. Okay, that is a function which is easy to compute, but difficult to invert. Okay, now, one of the triumphs of uh, theoretical cryptography in the 1980s was basically to prove that once you grant that there are one-way functions, then you've already got private key cryptography, okay? You don't, you don't really, you, you don't, you don't, at least you don't need to assume more than that, okay? Uh, so, so from a one-way function, you can build all sorts of private key cryptography and also authentication. So you could think of, you know, you know so we do know how to do cryptography, under the mere assumption that there are one-way functions, which is like a, you know, a modest strengthening of the P not equal to NP conjecture. But then, if you want public key cryptography, then you need stronger assumptions still. And the only way, because public key cryptography is asking for such a delicate balance, it's asking you know, that you should be able to encrypt a message to someone you know, using only their public key, using only information that they publish to the entire world, but in such a way that, that only they can decrypt it. You know, um, so encrypt a message using a huge composite number, but in such a way that only someone who knows the prime factors can decrypt the number. Okay, and it, it's sort of a mathematical miracle that that's ever possible, right? That that can be done at all. I mean, it was a great discovery in the 70s. Uh, uh, but, um, um, you know, but to this day, we only know how to get public key cryptography based on very specific mathematical problems with a lot of structure in them, like factoring or discrete logarithms or uh, elliptic curve problems or now the, these uh, short, finding short vectors in lattices, okay, or, or, or a few other problems like that. And these problems have exactly the types of structure that you might worry a quantum computer might be able to exploit. Okay, that is the fascinating trade-off. Okay, and now in the case of factoring and discrete log, we know that a quantum algorithm can exploit that structure. In the case, uh, and also elliptic curve problems, okay? In the case of um, uh, uh, the lattice-based problems, we don't know yet whether a quantum computer can exploit that structure or not. Okay, but uh, I think, you know, it is, uh, one of the great challenges of cryptography to, you know, base, base as much as we can, let's say, you know, if not on the mere assumption of P not equal to NP, then at least on the mere assumption that there are one-way functions or that there are NP problems that are hard on average. And, you know, the threat of quantum computers provides a very, very visible motivation for that, for that theoretical challenge. Thanks. So um, now the very last question. It is no. a bit cheeky, but it's been upvoted eight times. All right. So, um, so just just very briefly, with, uh, um, because we're almost out of time. But yeah. um, what experiment would convince you that quantum computers cannot do more than classical computers? Oh, so that's okay. I I, I was expecting something cheekier. That's yeah, a no, that's a that's 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 a that's a that's, a, that's, a, that's a perfectly fair question. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, either it would have to be like an experiment that reveals a breakdown in the basic principles of quantum mechanics. So like, for example, you know, like, like you know, there was this Bell inequality, right, that sort of proved the reality of entanglement between two separated particles, right? A quantum computer, you know, would exploit entanglement or, you know, quantum correlations among hundreds or thousands of, or millions of particles. Okay, but back in the uh, 60s and 70s, you know, there were people who did not even think that there would be entanglement between two particles. 
if they get, if they became far apart. And you know, and those people would often quote Einstein, who said that you know he couldn't accept that there would be spooky action at a distance. There would have to be hidden variables that would you know restore you know that would explain everything just in terms of uh, a classical correlation. Okay, but then uh, Bell proposed an experiment in the 60s. You know, at the time, it was just a thought experiment that said, you know, here's um, a set of measurements that you could do on two entangled particles where quantum mechanics predicts an outcome for that experiment that cannot possibly be explained by any local realistic theory. Okay, and then by the 80s, technology had advanced to where people could actually do this experiment, and the results you know, I mean, like you could say, you know, it, it, it could have gone either way, quote unquote, but the results were 100% consistent with quantum mechanics and inconsistent with local realism. Okay, now there have been local realist diehards for decades who have said, ah, but here's a loophole. You know, the experiment didn't account for this, didn't account for detector inefficiency, it didn't account, you know, there could be this conspiracy that, you know, restores Einsteinian locality if you assume this, this, and this. Okay, so just a year ago, there was finally an experiment done that closes all of these loopholes simultaneously, okay? So now the classical local realist skeptics are, I think, really backed into a corner, right? Um, you, you know, you basically, you know, you have to say, well, well, you know, you, you just didn't have the free will to set up the experiment the way you wanted to, because <laughs> the entire universe, including your own brain, are a gigantic conspiracy, okay? There, there is a, a Nobel laureate, you know, physicist, Gerard Hoof, who actually advocates that, okay? I won't, I won't comment further about it, okay? <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, I think for, for, you know, for most of us, okay, that, that was a clear experiment that if it had gone the other way, that would have said that actually quantum mechanics does not extend to these more complicated cases in, you know, in the way you might have thought. But, but actually the experiment said that quantum mechanics works just fine for the more complicated cases. Okay, now you could think of quantum computing as like the bell inequality on steroids. Okay, now we are testing quantum mechanics in this whole new regime, this regime of computational hardness. And it's possible that we will see a failure, that quantum mechanics will predict something and we will see something else. And, you know, at first we'll try to explain it by just fiddling with the Hamiltonian or, you know, sort of fiddling with the side assumptions. And, you know, and yet we won't be able to do that and we'll eventually be forced to replace quantum mechanics by some, you know, m more general framework that just includes quantum mechanics as a good approximation in some special cases. In that case, you know, from then on, we would have to talk about computation in that more general framework. And we would have to say, you know, you know, does that, uh, you know, the, the skeptics always assume that once that more general framework is discovered, that, that will bring us back down to classical computing. Okay, but of course, you know, n not, nothing says it has to be that. Maybe, the, maybe that new framework will let us do even more than quantum computers will let us do, right? You know, or, or you know, I mean, it, you know, all, all bets would be, would be off at that point. Okay, but that's, you know, the, I think, you know, that, that is the sort of thing you know, that, you know, like, that, that could happen that would, would tell you that quantum computing cannot work. Now, the, the one other possibility that some of the skeptics insist on is that they say, look, we're fine with quantum mechanics, we believe quantum mechanics, but there is this unremovable noise that's always going to be there. You know, there will be this decoherence that you can never get rid of, that you will not be able to fault tolerantly correct, uh, uh, you know, and, and that will always prevent quantum computation. Okay, and you know, and usually what, 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 they, what they really do is they just sort of start from the assumption that quantum computing is impossible, and then they work backwards to say, you know, what would nature have to be doing to make me right, right? And um, so it's kind of a strange exercise, but what they've found is that, you know, in order to kill quantum computing, like you need such bizarrely uh, conspiratorial and correlated forms of noise that you know, it's a mystery why they don't also kill classical computing, right? Uh, but you know, if if you know, again, we were to to discover this kind of unremovable noise, and someone were to give an actual theory explaining why is it there, why can it not be removed even in principle, why does quantum error correction not deal with it, then that would also be something that would convince me that quantum computing was impossible. And I should mention that I would find that. 
a thousand times more exciting than a mere success in building a quantum computer. Okay, building a quantum computer, that's the conservative possibility, right? But to change the laws of, you know, to change the known laws of physics, I mean, that would really be something. Okay. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. So let's, uh, let's